Hello. Today we're going to prove Snell's law using Fermat's theorem. And Fermat's theorem simply states that light takes the shortest path. Okay, in this case of Snell's law, it's a straight line. Snell's law states that the sine of the angle in medium 1 divided by the sine of the angle in medium 2 is equal to the velocity of the light in medium 1 divided by the velocity of light in medium 2. Okay, where theta 1 is the instant angle and theta 2 is the refractive angle. Okay, so basically O is the point, okay, or the source of light. Okay, here we have our boundary and then A is the end point. So lowercase a is simply the distance from O to the boundary. Okay, and x is the x-axis. It varies, it can increase or it can decrease. Okay, and t1 and t2 are time. So t1 is the time taken for the instant ray to go from O to the boundary, and t2, or you could say O to A, okay? And t2 is the time taken from light to get from the boundary to the endpoint, capital A. All right, so the total time, we can therefore write capital T, the total time is T1 plus T2, okay? That's the time taken to get from O to A. And we can write it in terms of integrals, just integrate an infinitesimal dt, okay? Right, now what about an infinitesimal distance, okay? An inf infinitesimal distance on the path of the light ray. Well, dl1 can be a small distance, okay, and it's simply the velocity multiplied by time. We can rearrange to find dt1 in terms of distance and velocity. And we can do that for the same in medium 2, an infinitesimal distance, okay, along the, the path of the light ray. dl2, okay, it's in the same format, dl2 divided by the velocity in 2. And then finally... We can therefore say the total time is the integral of dl1 divided by v1 plus the integral of dl2 divided by v2. Okay, nice and simple so far. Right. So what we can do now is we can focus on infinitesimal distances, dl1. Okay. What is dl1? Well. We already established that as a small distance on the path of the of the uh, light ray. Using Pythagoras' theorem, we can say that it's equal to the square root of dx squared plus dy squared. Okay, dx of course is an infinitesimal distance on the x-axis. Therefore, we can factor out a dx and say dl1 is equal to dx times the square root of 1 plus the derivative of y with respect to x squared. Okay. So that's dl1. Now, what is the sine of the angle? The sine of theta 1. Well, it's simply dy divided by the hypotenuse. Okay, but dl1 is dx squared plus dy squared. Okay, and using the format, format we had up here, dx, and then this root, we can therefore say that the sine of theta 1 Okay, this is important, so you need to remember this. The sine of theta 1 is equal to dy by dx times the square root, or divided by the square root of 1 plus dy by dx squared. Okay, this is the same in medium 1 and medium 2. So that could be sine theta 2 as well. All right, so before we said that t was equal to uh, this integral. Okay, that should be a plus, sorry. This integral plus that integral, okay, the total time. Right, so now we can write it in terms, but well, we can substitute dl1 for the root, so therefore we get 1 over v1, okay, times the integral from O to A, okay, from O to the boundary of the surface, dx times that root, plus the velocity in the medium 2, okay, multiplied by the integral from a, and then there's the boundary to the endpoint, capital A, multiplied by the same thing. All right, that is the total time. Just substitute what we had for DL1. Okay.
And as established, this is medium one, and that is medium two. Okay. Excellent. Now, we're going to have a quick mathematical interlude, and we're going to look at the theta function, okay? Because we want to combine our velocities, okay? Velocity one and velocity two, of course, they are um, different. So the theta function is a step function. Okay, and here's an example. Theta, uh, which is a function of t, is equal, okay, to 1 if t is greater than 0, or 0 if t is less than 0. So it's like a switch, in other words. Okay, and here we have a diagram to show it visually. When t is greater than 0, okay, on the t-axis, theta is 1. When t is less than 0, theta is 0. Now this is a good way to combine our velocities as a step function, okay? So before we had t was equal to this, and we want to combine 1 over v1 and 1 over v2. And so basically, we've defined 1 over vx, where vx is our step function in terms of our theta function. So the total time is equal from O to A, so that's the entire path of the light line. Okay, we just add the integrals. Uh, we can factor out dx1 plus dy over dx squared, and we need to combine our 1 over v1 and 1 over v2. So here we have 1 over vx. We have theta of a minus x over, v, uh, over v1. So basically it says that it's v1 if x is less than a, and v2 if x is greater than a. Okay, so therefore when we look at medium 1, the step function gets rid of the velocity 2, so we're left with v1. Okay, does that make sense? So v1 and v2 are constant, therefore vx is constant, although it depends on the variable x, it doesn't change the overall value. Does that make sense? Because it's either one or, or it's either v1 or v2. So we've combined our velocities in terms of a step function. Okay, it's almost like the Kronecker uh, delta symbol. Okay, it only allows certain values depending on x. All right, good. Next. So we've got it in terms of this. Now, we can therefore rewrite it in terms of 1 over vx, which is our step function, okay, in this nice simple integral. Now, Fermat's theorem. This, okay, the integral from O to A, the total time, okay, this must be the shortest path from 0 to A. In other words, it's the... Uh, straight line from our surface, then the straight line emerging from our surface. Okay, Fermat's theorem says light travels in a straight line. Therefore, we can use that to say that if this is the shortest path, it must satisfy the Euler-Lagrange equation. So, let gx equal uh, this, our integrand, 1 over vx squared to 1 plus dy over dx squared. And using the Euler-Lagrange equation, we can say that the partial derivative of g with respect to y minus the derivative with respect to x of this partial derivative of g with respect to dy by dx is zero. Okay? If you've not noticed already, this is zero because uh, g is only a function of x. So that becomes zero. Therefore, we can only say, we cover that up, that the derivative of this must be zero. The derivative of a constant is zero, right? So therefore, we can uh, conclude that the, this partial derivative with respect to g, uh, this par partial derivative of g with respect to dy by dx is a constant. So all we need now is to differentiate gx with respect to dy by dx squared. Now, one over vx is a constant, so we're only dealing with this. How do we differentiate the square root of 1 plus dy by dx squared? 
we can use the chain rule. And here I have the chain rule. So basically, all we do is we first of all differentiate this root. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So if we differentiate, we bring the 2 down, right? And then we minus 1, which is, of course, negative. Uh, bring the 2 down, uh, minus 1, okay? So therefore, we're going to get 1 over 2 square root of 1 plus dy by the x squared. But, there, but now we have to differentiate the smaller function. It's like the nested functions. We now have to differentiate 1 plus dy by the x squared, okay? As we have here, and that's, of course, simply... Uh, oh, we multiply it, sorry. 1, this, multiplied by this, will give us this. Use cancel to give us the overall derivative. Now, does that look familiar? Do you remember I said, memorise the sine of theta 1? Well, look. Sine of theta 1 is the exact same thing as the derivative. Okay. Isn't that interesting? So the overall derivative of g with respect to dy by dx is this. And that's a constant. This is sine of theta. This is looking very promising. So therefore, we can finally finish the video. Sine of theta 1 divided by v1 is equal to this, okay, where v is evaluated at 1. And then we, which is equal, of course, to this, evaluated at 2, which is equal to sine theta 2 divided by v2. Therefore, these are equal. We can rearrange to give us Snell's law. All right. So that's quite a neat proof. And I hope that made sense. And yes, so thank you for watching.